What is some advice that you wish someone had given you when you first started DMing or playing Dungeons and Dragons or any other role playing game for that matter? Game Masters here and I started playing Dungeons and Dragons well over 35 years ago. But this isn't about me, rather this is about you, the new Dungeon Masters and players. Of course, I certainly encourage older DMs and players to chime in with their own comments as we move through this advice packed video. For now, let's head inside so we can dive right into it. It's kind of cold out here. What I want to talk about today is some advice that we wish someone had given us when we first started playing Dungeons & Dragons. Well, really any kind of role-playing game for that matter. Now, even though I stated that this video isn't about me, I'm going to interject some of my own experiences as we go along, as that's, well, that's really my only point of reference. A few days ago, I asked, what is some advice that you wish someone had given you when you first started DMing? What is some advice that you wish someone had given you when you first started playing? MRDH says, relax and enjoy. You don't have to know it all. Listen, as a dungeon master, I get it. We were conditioned that we had to crack open the trinity of books, the uh, Dungeon Master's Guide, the Player's Handbook, and the Monster Manual, and memorize literally every word every page number where any given monster could be found, every spell, every feat, every encounter, uh, every table, all of it. The fact of the matter is you simply don't. Being familiar with the rules is never a bad thing for sure, but that's why the books exist. They're there for reference and guidance. It's not necessary to get all full of anxiety when planning a campaign or at least putting yourself into a position of not being able to have fun because you have to funnel the players from point A to point B, but somehow they've killed off the NPC that is supposed to tell them how to get to point C. I think most players are forgiving if you have to figure something out on the fly. And I think that most DMs recognize that they are doing this, running the game, uh, because they want to have fun too. And this goes hand in hand with what Twilight Garden's presentation says. And I want to address their reply in kind of one statement at a time. They say, don't worry about knowing the rules until you need them. Now, this is a great advice. Uh, as mentioned, it's great to be familiar with the rules. You want to jump across a five-foot crack in the dungeon floor or climb a rope that has oil on it. Well, that's going to be a dexterity check. And that's important, being familiar with the rules. But following up with what TGP said, uh, just knowing where to find those rules, that's just fine. I mean, there are a lot of things to remember, and it's simply impossible to absorb every line from every book uh, and just being able to have it on recall like that. Twilight's second bit of advice, you don't even need character sheets. This is all just organized make-believe and storytelling. Well, I mean, having character sheets does help, but yeah, I mean, I'd have to agree. You, you don't actually need them. In fact, in April, I'm starting up a campaign that won't use any books at all, uh, but more on that on a future video later. The point is that this is organized make-believe and storytelling. When I first started, I was a little more than just clueless. I mean, I had a clue as to what I was doing. But if someone had told me, Brian, it's just a fun game. You got to relax, have fun, and see how that advice has come up again, and just tell a damn good story. Well, if you can do that, the rules won't matter. No one is going to remember that you had to look up what a dexterity save was. All they're going to remember is that they jumped over a five-foot crack and saw demons rushing up from the floor uh, as they you know, leapt over that, that crevice. Yeah, if someone had told me to worry less about the rules and just to have fun, I think my earlier years of DMing would have gone much better. Rivers RPG channel says, don't be a dick. Buy more books and minis when you have a chance, especially Rao Partha. Well, <laughs> that's, yeah, pretty true words. Uh, and that goes for both DMs as well as players. Don't be a dick. Listen, no one wants to play with an arrogant a-hole. We are all gathered around the table to have fun. I get that we all have in our nature to uh, that drive uh, to want to be the best at something, to be the greatest. But in Dungeons & Dragons, you're playing with other people. You're in a party. Each member has their strength and each has their weaknesses. Speaking of, actually... Uh, actually, no, I'll tell you what, I'll talk about that in a moment. Some advice for the DM. We'll get to it. As for River's mention of buying books and minis, especially Ralph Partha, 
<laughs> yep. You know, hey, I'm a collector and I've been playing D&D, as mentioned, since the mid-1980s. If I had kept and still had all those books from way back then, I think a lot of my money issues would be taken care of. Yes, it'd be painful to separate from those books, but some of those original books and modules, man, they're worth a fair amount of money now. And Ralph Partha miniatures, they go for a premium mint, uh, mainly because most of them are considered to be uh, well, vintage. Uh, they're no longer being made. Nate Zabinski says, if you have 15 players, it's time to split the groups up. Now listen, this is going to happen. Uh, you're you're going to hone your skills as a DM. You're going to impress your players. They're going to tell other players. And those players are going to want to join. Their friends are going to want to join. The next thing you know, yeah, you're going to have 15, 18, 20 players wanting to play in your game. That's awesome. And I always hated to deny someone an opportunity to play. And it's entirely possible to DM a group of 20 or so players, but it actually boils down to quantity over quality. Simply put, if you have 20 players and four hours to play, how much time will each person actually get to actively participate in that game? Not to mention that combat is either going to be over very quickly, or you're going to have to throw a small army at the players for every combat situation. And then that's just not practical. So yeah, that's some great advice, Nate. Now to elaborate a little, back in the old Game Masters days, uh, mid-1990s, we ran official D&D games. I had a group grow in size, and as we grew, I would recruit another Dungeon Master to help out, and then we split the group. Now this was a group made campaign setting. Uh, I crafted the landscape, drew the map, and got input from the players as to what all they would like to see. Uh, mountains, deserts, stuff like that. And what would be fun, and together the campaign was created. The group was split, and the other DM took group two. Eventually, both of those groups grew in size, so we brought in a third DM and made a group three. Now, what happened was really magical. We had three gaming parties all taking place within the same campaign setting, and the three DMs would meet after each play session and talk about what their players had just done, and every so often we would cross paths, and players would move from group one to group two, from group three to group one, so on and so forth. And we did this for close to two years, and I gotta tell you, having a dynamic game like that where players were swapping in and out, there's nothing like it. And there was even times in which we all gathered together uh, as one big massive party and the three of us DMs would have them all fight, all the players fight, a large dragon or some other ugly monster. Uh, in essence, this was a raid, although we never really called it that. Remember, this kind of predated online games where that term was really popularized from. Earlier, I mentioned that we all have in our nature to want to be the best at something, to be the greatest. Uh, one piece of advice that I would love to give out is this. As a dungeon master, when you are making your campaign, or even if you are using an already published campaign setting, look at your players' characters and incorporate their strengths and weaknesses into your game. It's not you versus the players. You are there to guide them on their journey. Yes, you may have some wicked fun twists and turns and plot details that you want to throw at them, and that's perfectly fine. But the game should not be set up to squash their every attempt at doing something just because you didn't plan for it. The players all want to be the hero of the story. Okay, now you may encounter a few select uh, players that, that want to be the villain of the story, but overall, they have built their character, chosen the specific race, class, abilities, weapons, and gear because they think that it is going to give them an advantage over uh, something that you may or may not have thrown at them. For example, let's say they're needing to get inside of town, there's a massive wall, and you've designed this wall to be incredibly difficult to climb over, but they know that once they get in the town, they're going to have to fight a big battle. Well, so one player levitates up. You didn't count on that when you were designing this wall, but yeah, I mean, levitation allows them to get up there and help their friends up and over. Well, don't squash that. Fine, so what? Let them levitate up. Let them get their uh, the rest of the party members up and over the wall. They're still going to have to go fight this big battle inside. Don't worry about the little stuff like that. Let them have their moments. Let them have their fun. Or imagine this scenario. You create a session in which you know that someone is wanting to play a drow. Uh, these guys have sunlight sensitivity. That means they get disadvantage on attack rolls and perception checks when they're in bright sunlight. Do you just tell that player, 
tough shit and create a desert only campaign knowing that they will play with a disadvantage for the entire duration or do you find a way to deal with that element uh, possibly incorporating it into the game now i once read giving penalties for the sake of realism often come at the expense of fun that player certainly doesn't want to sit out or have their attack stunted for their entire duration of their play now real quick I'd like to ask you a favor. If you're enjoying this video, please give it a thumbs up, give it a like. Uh, I truly appreciate that and it helps to get this video out to more eyes. And I thank you kindly for that. Likewise, you know that your party has all kinds of magic items that you gave to them as they move through your campaign setting, but you noted that they have no way to really deal with a monster that makes acid-based attacks. So do you take advantage of that and just watch them die? There's just no fun in that. So yeah, I mean, sure, you want to give them all a challenge, but you don't want to create a Kobayashi Maru, a, a, a no-win scenario. Folks will just walk away unhappy. Also, don't let anyone tell you what you must or have to do with your game. Read the room, check your players as it were, and get away with what you can, but don't let someone shoehorn you into doing something that you are just fundamentally against. Uh, let me elaborate. I speak from experience on this one. I mentioned back in the old Game Masters days that I ran D&D games. One of the games I was running was a campaign in which one of the roads, Split Road, uh, would take the players to a place called that I called the Broken Arrow Inn. It was a large tavern run by vampires. They would lure unsuspecting adventurers in and subdue them and, well, feed upon them. And yeah, if that scenario found, sounds familiar, uh, I'll tell you why in just a bit. So my players made their way to the Broken Arrow Inn, ordered their food and drink, mingled around, asked some questions, just looking to see if there was any adventure to be had. Then all hell breaks loose. The patrons of the inn vamped out and started massacring the other NPCs and then turned on the players. And it was about to become a slaughter, and the players knew it. They were having a blast, pulling out every trick in the book that they had. All the while, more vampires were being thrown in at them. Uh, the players' party consisted of, uh, I think, like six players. Four died in that battle, and my manager, he pulled me aside and said, You can't kill them. They're paying customers. you got to fix that. And I asked, Well, what? They can find a healer if one, of the, if, if one of them survives. It'll be fine. I've got this all planned out. Don't worry about it. He responded, and I kid you not, if you want to keep your job, don't kill them. Make it a dream sequence. Have them all wake up. To this day, to my old manager, I still think that you, sir, are a pretentious... Uh, well, remember what Rivers RPG's channel advice said? Don't be a dick. Yeah, that's you. I made it a dream sequence because I didn't want to lose my job. I was intimidated into doing something that in my game I didn't want to do. I don't ever fall into that. The players immediately booed and hated that it was all a dream sequence. Thankfully, they had heard the conversation uh, because my manager was so that full of himself that he felt he could get away with uh, berating me and threatening me right there in front of them. And they gave him a fair amount of shit right back about it. And he that simply put, yeah, we're well, right. We are paying customers and we realize this is just a game. And if in the events of the game some of us die, we die. We just roll up new characters. And that is the takeaway advice. In normal circumstances, don't let anyone tell you what you have to do in your game. Do what you feel is right, of course. But like we mentioned earlier, read the room. If turning a total party kill into a dream sequence is the way to go, do that. If they all die and that's the end of the story, let that happen. Just be crafty enough to keep that element in there so that uh, when the players do roll up new characters, they may those well those new characters may very well run across the same tavern full of vampires now why did the broken arrow in scenario uh, the tavern full of vampires seem familiar well this leads into another piece of advice don't be scared to pull from popular culture for inspiration for your game at the time the movie uh, from quentin tarantino and robert rodriguez uh, uh, from dusk till dawn was super popular and I pulled inspiration from that. One could just as easily create a campaign in which players had to find a certain uh, ion stone or a group of them, let's say five, and normally ion stones will orbit around one's head, but let's say that an NPC artificer has created a glove capable of 
holding them and needs the party to gather them together. Or go with an old trope. They have to take a ring and destroy it by tossing it into a certain volcano. Yes, some may be quite obvious as to where they're pulled from, but that recognition can be a fun element for players and DMs alike to play through for themselves. Inspiration can be pulled from uh, books, movies, comics, even your last trip to Starbucks. That said, don't be afraid to use published material. Uh, Wizards of the Coast has a lot of content, as does Drive Through RPG and DMs Guild. But also don't hesitate to make up your own campaign setting and stories. Now quickly, I want to give a few shotgun bits of advice. First, some specifically for the players. Don't try to be the game hog. That is, realize that there are other players present and they get to contribute to the game just as much as you. Bring your own dice to the game. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Like the Dungeon Master, players have a lot to keep up with too. If you're unsure of a rule, ask questions. Don't argue with the DM. They're there to facilitate and advance the story. While it might be neat to totally roleplay out cooking a five-course meal, if you are only playing for four hours in any given night, spending three of those hours describing exactly how you are chopping up carrots and onions and deboning the mutton leg, it's just not necessary. Well, sometimes it can be. When rolling a character, you don't have to have an 18. And the most important advice for players, have fun. And now some specific advice directly for the Dungeon Master. Establish your house rules early on. Uh, spells don't need components. Bringing the DM a pizza awards bonus EXP at the end of the night. Uh, carrying 5,000 pieces of gold won't incur a weight penalty. Stuff like that. Let your players describe their reactions, not you. That is, don't tell the players that they're scared when vampires start attacking. Let them establish that for themselves. Allow them to roleplay that out. Don't overcreate your campaign. Players are always, almost always, going to go about things their own way. You may have spent six hours designing a dungeon layout that is west of town, uh, populating it with monsters, treasure, and other fun things, and the players just want to hop on a boat and sail east. Be flexible enough to move that dungeon to a remote island when they happen to crash land. Keep a list of names close by. You'll want this for random NPC names, and the players won't know if it's an important NPC or just a random one. And of course, most of all, have fun. The recurring theme here in advice to both players and DMs is to have fun. I mean, you are playing a game of Dungeons and Dragons, or Star Wars, or Vampire the Masquerade, or Cthulhu, or Paranoia, or whatever other tabletop role-playing game that, you're, that, that you happen to be playing. And the advice provided here can most certainly be applied to any of those games. Well, except Paranoia. I think even during character creation, the Game Master there is supposed to kill off one of the players. Keep in mind that the advice presented here hardly scratches the surface. I could easily go on for another four or five hours covering this subject, but I think really it boils down to don't be mean, and if you don't know something, just ask the question. No one is truly an expert with Dungeons & Dragons. I'm learning new things all the time. In fact, I made a video a few days ago about subclasses found in Mordenkainen Presents Monsters of the Multiverse, in which I was fully unaware that Arc Druids and Druids are actually present in the Monster Manual. Guys, I'm not embarrassed to admit I made a mistake in that video, and I've been DMing for, well, as I mentioned, over 35 years. Now, if you'd like to see my oops in context, you can check that video out here. DMs, what advice would you give to new Dungeon Masters and players? Players, what advice would you give to new players and DMs? What's something you would like the other half to be aware of to make the play experience for both sides more fun? Let me know in the comments below, and until next our paths cross, remember, don't be a... and bring your own dice.